lunches and ceremony. The next day was the last day before school was to start. It was also Melanie's last chance to put in effect her plan to get rid of the eyelashes. So after she went up to Mrs. Hall's apartment to see April, she took the library book that she was reading and the one that she knew April wanted to read. In April's room, they talked about the Egypt game and about school starting in the morning, what they were going to wear and things like that. Then Melanie suggested they read for a while. So they got comfortable on their stomachs across April's bed and started in on the books. And sure enough, April got up and took off her eyelashes so she could see better. But for once, both girls had a hard time keeping their minds on their reading. April was thinking about the next day, telling herself that it didn't matter whether the people at Wilson's school were friendly or not, because Dorothea would write soon saying she wanted April to come home. Dorothea, it seemed, ages since April had seen her. April shut her eyes and tried to picture her, but tonight the picture wouldn't come clear. It was only a blur, a blur of laughter and talk and movements and color. But a bright, beautiful blur, no matter how distant, was better than a reality that was dull and gray. Melanie was having trouble keeping her mind on her reading because she was so worried about what she was planning to do. In fact, they were both having such a hard time pretending not to worry that they were secretly relieved when Caroline came in and suggested it was bedtime for the girls who were going to be going to school in the morning. The eyelashes were lying on April's dresser and Melanie managed to walk right past them as she went out. Because of the sticky stuff to make them stay on your eyelids, she only had to brush her hand against them to pick them up. Feeling triumphant and treacherous at the same time, Melanie took the eyelashes home and hid them in her closet. She kept them there until the first few days of school were over. Then she took them back out to put them under April's dresser so that she, it would look as if they just happened to fall. By that time, April had gotten out of the notion of wearing them to school. But even without the eyelashes, Melanie had a hard time trying to translate April into something that Wilson School could understand and appreciate. April was still wearing her hair messy, unswept, and her mother's ratty old fur stole. Even though her grandmother had given her a great new jacket. Besides, she still put on her Hollywood act with people she didn't know. And worst of all, she got furiously angry when she was teased. Melanie could see that the kids at Wilson, all the stuff April knew, made her a know-it-all. Her wonderful differentness was the only kooky, was only kookiness, and her courage only meant she pushed you in the no punched you in the nose if you kidded her, no matter how many teachers were looking. At least that was the way it was for a while. But with Melanie, working her hardest as the go-between. It wasn't too long before things began to get a little bit better. The sixth grade began to find out that April had a way of making life interesting. For instance, when she raised her hand in class, her answer wasn't always what the teacher wanted, but it was almost certain to be fascinating. And when it came to guts, whether it was hanging by your heels from the highest bar or putting a stink bug in the principal's desk, you could count on April to do it first and best. By the third week in September, although the sixth graders were still teasing April from a safe distance, they were beginning to think of her rather proudly as their own private oddball. But it was when Toby and Ken gave her a nickname that Melanie knew for sure that the worst was over. Toby Avalar and Ken Kamata were two of the biggest wheels in class. And if you were really hopeless, they simply didn't notice you. It was as if you didn't exist. So when they started calling April, February, Melanie knew everything would be all right. It was teasing, maybe, but not the kind that you use on outsiders. In the meantime, in the afternoons, on the weekends, the Egypt game was really beginning to take shape. As soon as school was out every day, the girls picked up Marshall and his nursery school and hurried home. Then they were free to spend their time in Egypt until almost 5.30, when Caroline and the Roses came home. Then the lean-to temple now had two altars and two gods. The birdbath altar had been moved to the right side, while on the left was the altar of Set, the evil one. Set's altar was made from an egg crate covered by a piece of old bedspread 
and the god himself was a rather pear-shaped figure of dried mud. April and Melanie had looked and looked for a suitable set. For a while, they tried a Chinese kitchen god figuring from Schmidt's Valley store, but it was all wrong. Much too nice to be pleasant, much too nice and pleasant looking. At last, they had to resort to making a set themselves from some clay mud from the Casa Rosada's dead flower garden. Except for his glowing eyes, which were made of glass buttons and a deep fiery red, he didn't turn out particularly well. In fact, at first, he seemed rather laughable. But as time passed and as the game progressed, Set's face hardened and cracked into a wicked leer, and it became clear that his strange, sunken form Less body was the very shape of evil. Dark and deep as the mud of the Nile, Set brooded um, lumpily through the mist of sandalwood incense, 99 cents at Schmidt's, and all over all kinds of mystic ceremonies, weird rites, and wicked plots. Opposite the altar of the wicked gods stood the birdbath throne of the goddess of goddesses. Goodness, of course. She was still represented by the pluster bust of Nephrodite, but as the game went on, she began to be called Iris most of the time, because she was the goddess and not just a queen. And since the pharaohs were supposed to be related to the gods, it really didn't matter if Iris and Nephrodite got a bit confused. Whatever her name, what she stood for was always the same, love and beauty and every kind of perfection. There was always a great deal to do in the land of Egypt, Right at first, April and Melanie got terribly involved in composing and practicing rites and ceremonies for the two gods. The rituals were very complicated, and the correct order of processions, chants, sprinklings with holy water and sacrificial offerings had to be carefully written down so that they wouldn't be forgotten. At first, the records were ordinary notebook paper. Then Melanie, whose handwriting was the nicest, put it all down on onion skin paper rolled on pieces of old-fashioned fishing pole that they found in the alley. Each page was glued to two pieces of pole so it could be rolled and unrolled like a papyrus scroll. Someday, they decided they would do it all over again in hieroglyphics when they found time to finish their hieroglyphic alphabet. But for the present, it was just written in English. Then when Mar Marshall discovered that the wooden base of the Diana statue was hollow and on one side was a little loose, they had a perfect secret vault for the storage of sacred records. Of course, the temple and the two altars had to be decorated too. If it wasn't at all difficult to find the right sort of things for their altar, Nephrodites slash Iris. Flowers, candles, beads, pretty stones, blown glass figurines of birds and deers. In fact, anything beautiful seemed to suit the lovely goddess. One day, Melanie bought her poster paints and they painted stars and birds and flowers on the fence in the back of the altar. And another day, they made a canopy to hang over Nephrodite's head. They made it from an old fluffy half slip of crinoline and lace. But when they were through cutting and penning and tacking, it looked exactly like a canopy and not like a petticoat at all. Set was more of a problem. For a while, he had only his incense burning or incense burner, which was made of an old metal ashtray. April suggested that they might find something suitable in Professor's store, but Melanie wouldn't go with, go with her to help shop. Melanie had lived too long in the neighborhood and ha had been almost brought up on all those scary rumors about the professor. And besides, she said, what could they buy for 50 cents, which was about all they could scrape up at the time. So Set had to settle from some spiders and snakes painted on a wall behind him and a dry bone that hung on a string above his head. April had gone to the trouble of tricking an unfriendly dog out of the bone because it was so large and sinister looking, and it had to be just the right effect hanging over the evil god, twisting and turning in the wind. Then one day on the way to school, Melanie found a strange dark stone. It was lying in the middle of the sidewalk where the stone had no reason to be. But even more mysterious, when you held it just the right angle, it looked exactly like a pair of long pointed jaws with a bulging snout and jagged teeth. Hey, there's no doubt about it, April said. It's no ordinary rock, that's for sure. So they put it on the altar too and called it the crocodile stone. And from then on, it became the mysterious and powerful source of much of Set's power. At first, Marshall, 
only watch everything that was going on. But after a while, he began to be important and wanted to know, when are you going to play about the Pharaoh more? Like you said, when April told him they wouldn't be ready for that for a long time, his chin began to stick out. So to keep him happy, they let him start being some sort of junior high priest. At the next ceremony, which was to be the present presentation of a dead lizard as a sacrificial offering to set, Marshall marched the head of the procession and sprinkled holy water from the tuna can. He did a good job too, except that he wouldn't put scrutiny down or security down, not even to be the high priestess. At first, April said nobody could be the high priestess of an evil god with a toy octopus hanging around his neck. But she finally agreed they could pretend it was one kind of fancy ceremonial robe. And when the procession was over, she had to admit that Marshall had done awfully well for a little kid. He even remembered all the words to the chant he sprinkled in all the right places, she said, wonderingly. But Melanie wasn't surprised at all. That's the way with Marshall, she said. He's been awfully grown up ever since. Oh, since about the time he started walking, that is. About everything except security. I guess he's not very grown up about that. Dad said the reason Marshall needs security is that he had such a hard time being a baby. Dad says being a baby offended Marshall's indignity or dignity. April shrugged. Yeah, I guess everybody has something they're not very grown up about, she said.